about two years. So then, uh, uh, sorry, not two years, sorry, two hours. So then uh, I guess uh, as the time, we have a limited time. So I think we should start. So welcome uh, everyone for this session. Um, this is our uh, second session of the uh, series of three series of uh, Avans, uh, as part of the Avan Thinkers campus. And this is the um, the first one was the theme under this forced migration in cities, which was done in October. And then today's session is will be on uh, refugees and settlements. Uh, and then we have the wide selections of panelists and speakers. So um, we have three speakers uh, in the first and then the second uh, sessions with the three uh, more focused on uh, East Africa. And as you can, as uh, we all know that uh, the globally, the number of refugees has been increasing and, uh, but especially in the urban area, it's more and more. And so we are hoping that we can discuss um, some of the issues and um, gaps and some of the example, especially from the second uh, part uh, to kind of see and then together with uh, um, all everyone to discuss and uh, think of uh, the way forward or the kind of example to see. Uh, so the sec this second session is de dedicated to really sharing experiences and lesson learned internationally and uh, so the second session will be from uh, the Kenya, Uganda, and as we do have also from Bangladesh. Uh, thanks, Noloka, for joining us. And uh, we will introduce uh, best practices and proposal from data corrections and um, uh, sound decisions and uh, for inclusion of refugees. And uh, and then uh, let's, without taking any time, uh, Maybe let me welcome the first speaker. So the, our first speaker is the Dr. Bridget Homan. Uh, so she's the senior migration specialist uh, in the City Alliance. And she leads this um, City Alliance global programs on the uh, cities and migrations, which supports uh, supported by city, uh, Swiss agencies for uh, development and corporations. Uh, which programs aims to enable partner cities, uh, local governments, host communities, and migrants to manage challenges and leverage opportunities arising from migration to cities in low income countries for sustainable and uh, inclusive development. Uh, and then she has a great number of uh, 14 years of professional experience uh, with a focus of labor migration in both rural and urban areas in Asia and Africa. So we really look forward to hear from you. Uh, welcome, Bridget. Bernard, maybe, yes. Now you can hear me. Thank you very much, Yuka. Um, it is actually my pleasure to be here today and to join hands with you and Habitat for this series of uh, urban uh, thinker campuses on the topic of cities and displacement. Um, a very well, warm welcome to the fellow panel members and to the participants online. Um, pleasure to seeing you all here today. Um, now, I have the, the privilege to introduce the Cities Alliance to you and also to introduce to you how a Cities Alliance wants to draw attention to cities and refugees. Next slide, please. Um, the Cities Alliance is first and foremost a global partnership, which operates a multi-donor trust fund to address key challenges of urban poverty through knowledge generation, advocacy, and implementation on the ground. Now here you see a picture on how we work on the ground. This is a picture from Liberia, where the Cities Alliance worked with communities, with the local government to identify needs. And here we established sanitation facilities in slum dwelling areas. Next slide, please. The Cities Alliance turns 20 years um, this year. It was first hosted by the World Bank and now by UNOPS, but it continues with the same mandate to fight urban poverty and promote the role of cities to do so. Over the past decade, Cities Alliance particularly focused on secondary cities in low-income countries, which by size and economic and political power 
have less influence to manage key dynamics at the local level. And migration is one such example. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the Cities Alliance is a global partnership of today about 30 members. And these members represent a very diverse constituency. But they all have one common aim, to promote the role of cities and to reduce poverty. This is why they come together at the Cities Alliance and to join in a partnership. These constituencies have, however, very different approaches and mandates to achieve such a common aim. The value of the Alliance is that we can convene them at one table on different topics, where they can meet, they can argue, they can discuss, and eventually they join hands for a common strategy. And it's also important to note that all of those members also contribute financially to implement the strategy. An example is today's dialogue. If you look at the panel members, you will see that they represent a very diverse constituency speaking about the topic on cities and refugees. And this is, this is what the Cities Alliance is doing, providing the space for different constituencies to voice their needs, their interests, their capacity to address a common, common problem. Today in the panel, we have the governor of Tukana representing the Kenyan government. We have AFSI representing civil society. We have IID representing research and academia, and UN Habitat and UNHCR representing the multilateral development constitution. Next slide, please. Now, the members of the Cities Alliance with leadership by the Swiss government steered the Alliance to set a strategic focus on cities and migration. A dedicated program works with secondary cities in low-income countries and ways to improve local migration management. Geographic operations span from the Horn of Africa, North Africa and Latin America. But for today's panel, with a focus on forced displacement and specifically refugees, we will focus on two contexts in the Horn of Africa. You will hear today in the second half of this discussion from our partner UN Habitat on our joint work in Kenya, where we leverage the opportunities refugees represent for a local economy. This will be followed by testimony by the governor of Tukana. And eventually, you will hear from our partner AFSI on our joint work in Uganda to enumerate refugees with support of the Uganda Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development and the National Bureau of Statistics. Next slide, please. Now, while both of our, our partners, Jan Habitat and AFSI, will represent the work on the ground, I just want to give you a glimpse on how the Cities Alliance elevates these experiences on the ground and provides a platform for our local partners, for our cities, to voice their respective needs and strengths. Um, we recently could provide a platform for our partners in Ethiopia to provide a testimony in front of the United Nations General, General Secretary's high-level panel on internal displacement. This offered Adama City, which received about 10,000 IDPs over a very short period of time, the opportunity to tell the high-level panel on their strength to manage the situation locally and what type of support they further would need to integrate IDPs. Next slide, please. Now, aside of this example where we lift local experience to a global level, um, we also foster um, regional exchange among practitioners. Now, here, this slide shows you an event from last year, and it's very fitting for, for today's discussion, because it shows representatives from Uganda, from a city in the north, Arua, with the mayor, local government representatives, slum dweller representatives, and the national government of Uganda discussing the refugee situation in the secondary city. This was a very powerful discussion among the practitioners, and they could exchange with their peers from Kenya and from Ethiopia. And eventually, this exchange also contributed to the project, which AFSI will present later today. We go to the final slide. Now, here you see a couple of pictures from our members. 
um, we will shortly screen a video where some of the members of the Cities Alliance voice their perspective on cities and migration. And the video will also show you a case from Uganda, which is fitting to today's panel, um, where the refugee situation is worse right. And obviously later on, we'll present you how a development actor can support uh, a local government to manage the situation um, in a better way. This is all from my side. I hand over back to Yuka and to Bernard to show the video. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bridget. Um, Bernard, maybe we can show video.
think thanks so much for this video. I think it shows some of, uh, especially some words that um, that is coming from the the local. It really shows the kind of the ground. Um, now we want to. Um, I think we. I just wanted to mention to the the participants um, that we do have a chat that it's open, uh, which is. I, if you have any questions uh, during the presentations, or uh, we do have a questions answer after two more um, uh, presenters, but after uh, during the sessions, we will look at the chat. So if you have any question that is coming up now, please uh, type it in, and then uh, we will collect accordingly. Thanks. So we will move to uh, now the second uh, speakers, which is uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Lucy. Uh, 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 sorry for pronunciation. Uh, she is the uh, principal researcher um, at the International Institute for Environment and uh, Development. And uh, um, she leads the research and policy engagement on urban crisis and urban force displacement. And it's, she is the uh, principal investigator on the three year. UK fund aid funded uh, studies comparing well-being and uh, self-resilience of refugees in camps and urban areas in uh, four countries. And she also has, uh, she used to also be an urban advisor at the UK Department for International uh, Development, which is the FID. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rusi. Thank you, Yuka, um, and thanks for the opportunity to um, present to you all today. Um, what this presentation is going to be is a bit of a, uh, an introduction to a project that I'm leading that Yuka just mentioned, um, and a bit of a watch this space because this is a new project. It's, um, it's going to be uh, at least three years, possibly slightly longer, given delays due to COVID. Um, and we're going to be producing a lot of very interesting and novel evidence through this project. Um, but we, we're only just beginning, so I can't really give you any findings as yet, but I can whet your appetites for finding out more. So could you have the, the next slide, please? Um, and you can go on to the next one. Thank you. I wanted to talk briefly about what IID is. So we're a research institute between academia and policy. Um, and we have a history of working on a lot of urban issues, including in collaboration with Cities Alliance and with UN Habitat over many years. Um, so these are some of the themes that we're known for our work on, on urban poverty and urbanization, health, access to houses, housing and basic services, climate change, adaptation and resilience is a very strong area of our work. Um, historically looking at issues around urban rural migration and then more recently on urban crises. So next slide, please. And the way we work is also quite special. It makes us a little bit different from uh, university-based researchers. We do our work with and for partners, uh, many of them are grassroots groups of the urban poor, notably SDI, who you've already heard about, but also the Asian Co Coalition for Housing Rights and other federations of grassroots groups around the world. We work with universities and research institutes in low middle income countries, and we also work with and through municipal authorities and city networks. Next slide, please. So the work that I'm doing um, is broadly under the heading of urban crises, and this is relatively new for IID. Um, I think people who know the Institute don't associate us with this type of work so much, but it dates from a collaboration with DFID um, back in 20, started back in 2014. It's a program on urban crises that was shared between the International Rescue Committee and IID. And the idea was to promote learning and documentation of grassroots and municipal government approaches to disaster preparedness and response, including displacement crises. We also looked at um, responses to large scale disasters, like, for example, the Port au Prince earthquake in 2010 and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, etc. And I was leading this program from DFID at the time, and um, I purposely brought together the International Rescue Committee, a large humanitarian organization that focuses on responses to forced displacement. With my now colleagues at IID, these urban development specialists, precisely because there was a need to get the development actors and the humanitarian actors in talking together so that the humanitarians could understand a bit more about how urban systems work and how they can interact with those systems rather than act up against them. And the idea was also to broaden the perspectives of people who work on an urban development, to be more conscious of what, how cities react and are affected by crises, including displacement crises, 
there is still a big divide in many aid agencies um, around the world and also in academia between people who work on development and people who work on humanitarian issues. And part of the point of this program was to start to narrow that division. And so this program produced a wealth of working papers, briefing notes, toolkits and guidance, and you can find all of those on IID's website. I can admit it's not the easiest website to navigate, but I think a search around urban crises um, should bring up uh, quite a lot of interesting, um, interesting information. So I have the next slide, please. So the, the piece of work I want to talk about for the next few minutes uh, its short title is Protracted Displacement in an Urban World. We gave it an even longer title to begin with, it's perhaps not very sensible. Um, but this is funded, as you can mention, by the UK government through the Global Challenges Research Fund. So it's aid money, but it's aid money for research that has is meant to have an impact. So it's a sort of very specific um, fund, type of funding, the Global Challenges Research Fund. And this is a three million pound project over three, three and a half years. It's quite big for research and in four countries. So could I have the next slide, please? So as we know, and as we've seen from the presentation just now, uh, the majority of the world's displaced people are in urban areas. And refugees and internally displaced people are likely to end up in informal settlements, either when they arrive or in some cases where their assets have been de depleted after arriving, perhaps with, um, with money or with other assets um, seeking refuge. But the majority of donor funding and attention is focused on refugees and IDPs in camps, and research has tended to follow suit. And the point of this project is to redress this imbalance. We want to use our expertise on urban informality, poverty and local governance to bring a new lens to the debates on responses to protracted displacement. Um, so the audience for this research is local government, but is also international humanitarian policy and policymakers. So the next slide, please. So we're aiming to build an evidence base for national and local governments, humanitarian agencies, I just mentioned, donors, on the opportunities and challenges of hosting displaced people in camps and urban areas. And this is a comparative project. I'll come to that on my next slide, but it is a comparison between the camp and the urban. It's to promote an assessment of current responses to urban protracted displacement, raising awareness of unmet need, and the idea is also to build the capacity of municipal authorities, displaced people, organisations, the urban poor and others to use participatory planning to underpin um, and to co-produce development based solutions to force displacement. And so, as I mentioned, this is academic research money for, for this project, but it, it does aim to have an impact. And one of the things we're doing is bringing in municipal stakeholders right from the start of the project so that they're helping us discuss our research questions even and then helping us analyze the data and use the data as it emerges uh, to think about what kind of responses could be put in place to make cities more welcoming places, refugees and IDPs, at the same time as supporting host communities in informal settlements. Can I have the next slide? So I'll be upfront, we're a bunch of urbanists at IID, and this is, we do have a hypothesis. <laughs> We're looking at the comparison, we're looking to compare well-being, self-reliance and productive livelihoods of displaced people in camps and urban areas. So the comparison is mainly between camp and urban, but it is also between the four countries. I'll come to them in just a minute. But we do hope to demonstrate the potential of urban areas to provide a welcoming and productive environment in which displaced people can live with dignity. So we, we want to show how conditions are right now for refugees in urban areas and compare that with camps but also show the potential um, that place urban areas could be better, P possibly already are better, but could be better um, environments for refugees and displaced people. So the next slide. So these are the field work locations that we identified early on this year in the project. Um, given what's happening in Ethiopia, we may have to change our focus. And then this will may also impact on um, the population we research in Kenya as we're trying to look at a different displaced population in each country. So the idea is that we look at Somali refugees in Dadaab and Nairobi. We look at Eritrean refugees in the camps in the north of Ethiopia and in Addis. We look at Syrian refugees in Al Azraq camp and in Amman. And we look at um, returnees and internally displaced people who are living in um, Jalalabad city and then in an IDP settlement um, in Kabul province called Barikar. Next slide, please. 
So here's, I'm not going to go through this, but just uh, just so you can see that it's a mixture of universities um, in the UK and in the in our research countries, and then international and local um, civil society organizations as well. Next slide. So there are three main work packages, the three things that we're mainly focusing our attention on in this research. The first of those is understanding refugee and IDP perceptions and levels of well-being in urban and camp settings. And we will start off by actually asking groups of refugees and host people, what does it mean to have well-being, to have a good life? Uh, to uh, have a sustainable livelihood. And then the idea is we test that through a large survey and through qualitative research as well. So we want to, we don't want to have too many preconceptions about what it means to have a good life, to achieve well-being. And then the same on the livelihood side of things. We want to go beyond the idea of jobs to look at other productive activities that might be housework, sort of to support a household business. It might be entrepreneurship. And to look at what refugees and IDPs are already doing in terms of their economic activity and their contributions and what the barriers are for them to do, to preventing them from doing more. But this idea that we don't really understand the networked economies of refugees and IDPs, the way, the extent to which they're hiring other people, either from their own community or the host community, the extent of their transborder um, economic networks. And then finally, as I mentioned, this attempt to develop the capacity of municipal and other local actors to collectively come up with solutions to the issue of protracted displacement in urban areas. So next slide, please. So this is just some uh, background to the types of methods we're using, a literature review, context analysis, this participatory way in which we're designing the survey, and focus groups as well to make sure we've really understood what these terms mean for the people themselves. Then you see the quantitative data collection is quite big survey, I'd say it's 870 surveys in each country. And then quite extensive qualitative data collection as well with semi-structured interviews, interviews with key stakeholders, focus groups and case studies. And there the case studies are refugee owned and run businesses. So we understand in more depth how those work and the challenges that people face in terms of operating legitimately and legally in countries where their right to work might be challenged or problematized. Next slide, please. And then this is the work package three, which was the one around the municipal forums and the various ways in which we're reaching out um, to get the right mixture of people. Um, those forums will meet every six months as we work through the program. And the idea is also that we'll be drafting guidance and documenting lessons of policy and practice that are relevant beyond the cities that are the focus of this research. The next slide. Um, so. We're trying to influence displacement debates. And I had an interesting conversation yesterday with a representative of a large bilateral donor who looked at some of our preparatory materials for the research project and said, well, humanitarian caseloads are rising. Um, the budgets are getting bigger and bigger. The extent to which we can we have money to fund humanitarian activities is getting smaller and smaller. Do humanitarians really have to bother about working on well-being as well? Isn't that just something else that's gonna suck up money? And I have to say, this is, to me, was quite um, surprising that someone would say this, but I think it lends itself to this fact that displaced people are becoming just like statistics. I think that's something that's, um, Amelia Sayer said in, in the in the video we just saw, but displaced people are not just, just statistics, <laughs> they're not just faceless individuals who need to be somehow maintained they should be given every opportunity to flourish as human beings. And I personally think it's wrong to be spending the vast majority of humanitarian funds that go towards displaced people on maintaining people in what is probably a state of ill-being in camps. It's really a missed opportunity to think about how we might support urban life and the benefits of urban living for displaced people. Yes, this is politically difficult, complex, but there are city authorities out there, as we've seen through the video just now, who are open to working with displaced people and to finding and who need help to bolster their urban services so that they reach a broader population. So uh, I'm not we're not necessarily saying that suddenly we need to up the humanitarian aid budget to work on well-being as well. It's more what are the opportunities to support well-being in the places where refugees want to be? So we're trying to change the discourse on urban refugees and IDPs and through this research and through its outputs start to influence policymakers at the municipal level, 
by helping them see the benefits that can come from supporting refugee um, livelihoods and lives. At the national level, we're also drawing in the relevant actors into discussions about the research. And the international level, so I'm very pleased to say that UN Habitat is an active participant on our advisory group. We also have the agency formerly known as DFID, um, which is now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. It's very odd to have to say that as a British person who used to work there to, to give it its new name, but um, it no longer exists in that form. Also the bank, um, we have um, support from academic, um, support from the University of, of Witzvorterand in South Africa, the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat, and finally also SDI International, the Shack Slum Dwellers International. And actually there, I want to end on this kind of really interesting positive note. Um, it's for, I think personally I think it's it's fantastic that we're able to bring SDI into this project because traditionally they haven't really thought a great deal about um, displaced people in the cities and the informal settlements where they work. So it's great to see the example of Arua, but I think that's probably one of the only places where SDI is actually actively thinking about how to work with refugees and to bring their needs into conversations with national government with municipal government. And that's really encouraging. And um, their model is um, has is generally around savings groups um, and uh, discussing discussions around upgrading with, with municipal authorities. Um, but in Nairobi, where we're working with SDI, this has been a real eye-opening um, introduction to them. They've actually off their own bat gone out and sought to talk with refugees in some of the settlements where they're working. And it's really captured their imagination. And it led SDI off their own bats um, to put together a documentary working with their youth um, youth media team, Know Your City TV. And they've created a really quite hard hitting, challenging documentary around urban refugees in Nairobi. I'm going to um, share, if I can manage this, I'm going to try and share the I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to share the um, the link to the YouTube film. There you are, so you can watch it as a 30 minute documentary. And it is quite a challenging film. Um, it does show the sort of really quite some of the negative coping strategies that urban refugees are resorting to, particularly as a result of COVID. But it's also an offer to talk. And the idea is that slowly we think that the government might be more interested in talking about refugee issues. And there's a lot of willing people who want to enter into those conversations. And we would hope that that would also be the beginnings of conversations with our colleagues in UNHCR as well to think about what additional steps they can take to implement their policies on alternatives to camps and on urban refugees. And that must include a conversation, as we know, with municipal authorities. So I think that's probably my last slide. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucy. Um, as I said, if you have any question, I see some questions are coming up, so please put it in the chat. I'm already collecting some, uh, especially to Dr. Lucy as well. So we can discuss um, probably after the Nodoka, which is the next presenter uh, during the uh, question and answer. So next uh, presenter is Ms. Nodoka Hasegawa. She, uh, she is the Senior Development Officer. She works in uh, UNSR Cox's Bazaar and she joined uh, in uh, from 2019. And actually she is the first field-based uh, senior development officer in UNSCR. As you know, the UNSCR is, a hum uh, is trying to kind of uh, reaching out to development side and they are hiring 30 development positions globally. And uh, Nodoka do have, uh, um, uh, prior to this, Nodoka was uh, working as a social development specialist at the World Bank. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and then please, uh, I would like to welcome Ms. Nodoka. Welcome. Yuka, um, I hope you hear me well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Yuka just mentioned, UNHCR has been recruiting staff like myself with development background um, to strengthen development partnership as well as to operationalize the humanitarian development peace nexus in recent years. And we are working, learning and trying to adapt at the same time. So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity. Um, thank you to the organizers um, for giving me this opportunity to share my experience and challenges we are facing in Bangladesh 
as an example of a context where there's a strong interest in pursuing humanitarian development nexus agenda, where there is almost no political will, if you like. Next slide, please. So um, I've heard that there aren't many people who are currently working in Bangladesh in the audience. So um, let me start with briefly explaining the context. Bangladesh Cox's Bazaar is just across the river from Rakhine State, Myanmar. Cox's Bazaar hosts 860,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. The most recent and largest influx was in August 2017, but this was not the first influx. It is also the fastest growing and most congested refugee camp in the world at the moment. Except for the two old registered camps, um, 32 camps are self-settled and in population size, it's equival equival equivalent to one of the most largest urban cities in Bangladesh, almost around the fourth largest city. Next slide, please. Also to give a background of Cox's Bazaar, Cox's Bazaar is not in the middle of nowhere. It is a tourist destination for Bangladeshis with a very long sandy beachfront and also known for tropical rainforest in the southern part of the peninsula. But at the same time, it is one of the most economically lagging regions in Bangladesh with high level of poverty and also high reliance on daily or seasonal labor. It is also prone to natural disaster. And on top of that, the impact of refugee influx is significant. Initially, the host community people were the first respondents to the crisis, like everywhere else in the world. But negative perceptions are growing. Now we are in three years um, from the influx. Um, deforestation, increasing cost of living, increased traffic due to humanitarians, contrast between the host community people's lives and services provided in the camps are also something that we need to address maintaining also to, um, yeah, we have to make sure that the protection space for refugees is in place. Next, next slide, please. So this is a long list of policy constraints that the Rohingyas face. On the legal front, Bangladesh is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention or to the 1967 Protocol, and has also not adopted a national refugee law. Refugee status is not provided to majority of Rohingyas, only 35,000, which is like 40% of the total Rohingya population, are registered refugees. And they are from the previous influx. Government also denies refugees access to socioeconomic rights, access to education, and right to work. There's also no freedom of movement, access to national services. There are also restrictions to obtain civil documentation. So basically, voluntary repatriation to Myanmar is seen as the sole solution by Bangladeshi authorities. That leads to refusal of long-term planning. Repatriation similarly is something that, that is what the refugees are requesting for as long as the situation in Myanmar improves. And UNHCR fully supports that. Also, the security measures in the camp, and also um, possibility of moving the refugees to floating island, has been a long topic that has that comes in and goes. Next slide, please. So operationalizing humanitarian development nexus in this context, what does it mean? We try implement global compact on refugees through supporting the country of origin for safe and dignified return. 
we aim at addressing the root causes of displacement and provide roadmap for creating conditions that would be conducive for voluntary return to Myanmar. We also work on easing pressure on host community. At the moment, we have 10 sectors working in two sub-districts where the camps are hosted. And this is not only UNHCR, but we advocate to other development actors and humanitarian actors to support host, the host community. We also strengthen partnership with development actors, which is one of my portfolio. Particularly in Bangladesh, World Bank and the Asian Development Bank has been investing 700 million US dollars from the onset of the influx. These projects cover infrastructure support, social protection, capacity building on health and education, and so on. Other development actors are also active in project implementation as well as policy advocacy. Spatial planning in camp, as I pointed at the beginning, the scale of this area being equivalent to an urban city and also with a very, very limited space, these development banks investment and also others that are put in place could be strategically spent by having a more proper spatial planning. UN Habitat colleagues have been instrumental in providing technical support to drafting the macro settlement development plan. And this definitely needs higher level of political buy-in to have widely accepted by the government and broader stakeholders. We also try to ensure there is a link between border development planning and region. In Cox's Bazar, local planning is supported by UN agencies, World Bank and JICA. And one key element, which was also mentioned in other presentations is that we have to align expectations and perceptions between humanitarian and development actors. Translating language and understanding both perspectives is probably something that people working in humanitarian development um, between the, the two actors are often facing. For example, humanitarians' expectation of timescale of development actors influencing creating policy change may not be realistic. On the humanitarian side, SDGs are, are not always a topic that is discussed or considered. Maybe it's too conceptual. Development actors could think how to operationalize and link issues to SDGs and translate them into a more concrete action so that the humanitarians can see the value and take note for Nexus so that issues are linked to wider agenda. Also through the bank projects, humanitarians are learning the government systems also to frame issues on environmental and social safeguards. And these are new ways of working for all of us. And on policy advocacy, a lot of groundwork has been done, trying not to touch the policy restrictions, but ultimately we need to lead, lead this to policy dialogue for a systematic change. What we do now is to track key policy restrictions and ensure the field level activities are also linked to those and monitor and approach the status of dialogue with the government. Sometimes because of our humanitarian annual planning, these things are difficult, but as, a, as an organization, UNHCR is also thinking of shifting towards multi-year planning. In a bigger picture, I think it requires a change in narrative that refugees greater access to services and also to socioeconomic rights are not undermining the government's policy to voluntary return. We are supportive to that. I think I will stop here now. Um, if there's any questions, um, feel free to send me emails too. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Noroka. Um, and then I think uh, um, we have uh, several questions. So maybe uh, before uh, I hand it over to Bridget for the second sessions, um, I think we should have a question and answer. Um, Bridget, I th uh, if I can ask, um, I think that Somalia, uh, I think the person from Somalia who are interested in the kind of, uh, if they have any partnership, how do we make it? Um... I, I saw it, Yuko, I saw the question. Yes. <laughs> I, I think, first of all, I also wanted to just have a quick reaction to the fellow panelists. Thanks a lot for, for your inputs. I also followed the questions on the chat and it was very interesting to observe how how the silos in which we respectively think because of our profession or the organization or government entity which we represent, we find ourselves. No? But at the same time, we all recognize the limitations of these silos in which we think. And I found it interesting that it went through all this representation and also through the chat with intervention from IOM and SSC. And I think, um, yeah, it's just time to act up on it. And let's find means, you know, by by coming together of those who are interested to work together and find a joint answer to it. Um, on the questions which I saw in the chat, many things for the question from uh, Somalia. Um, the Cities Alliance is at the moment, um, with the support of Switzerland, uh, implementing a program in the Horn of Africa. We are quite strong in Ethiopia and work there in the Somali region, in uh, Chitia and also in Diridaba. And we will also build relationship to the city of Kibilia and uh, um, Boromia. Um, we have an event coming up in the end of this month where we wanted to have representatives joining us. So um, the answer is yes, we, we are coming and we will be there and we will be happy to work with you. Thank you, Yuka. Thank you. Um, maybe Dr. Rusi, um I guess uh, maybe not all of them, but uh, I guess some of them, uh, maybe you can answer to some of the chat, uh, which is, for example, I guess the, um, there are some folks that is interested center of migrations, and then also there is uh, something which is about how is how might you be using um, global compact for refugees, global for compact for migrations, all these things to be harnessed to changes in this course. And thanks to um, our Swiss Development Corporations of Nairobi, uh, Saverne, sorry if I uh, uh, misspelled, <laughs> uh, but uh, asking for why not mentioning development donor as well. Sure, thank you, Yuka. I mean, thank you everyone for the questions and I can rapidly answer all of them, I think. So, Rebecca, uh, I don't know very much about the Nigeria case, but I am part of a new, a very large um, research consortium called African Cities, um, which is funded by the UK government. And one of the cities that will be part of that project is Mediguri. Um, I'm also um, just getting to know a fellow PhD student um, at the University of Sheffield who's working on IDPs in Mediguri. So if you want to find my email on um, the IID site, I will connect you. Um, Severine, okay, so I didn't, I don't think I did mention humanitarian donors, I mentioned humanitarian agencies. And actually the donor I was speaking to yesterday is a donor in which, like mm, a lot of countries, the humanitarian and the development are housed within the same agency. My point is that when it's a displaced population, the response is generally an instant one around a humanitarian response. And actually it's a difficult for development actors to find the space within their own agencies to talk about what's going on in terms of longer term impacts, particularly on cities. So if you think about what happened in Lebanon um, after the uh, arrival of many Syrian refugees, it was a very long time before people began to listen to um, people from the World Bank and others who were pointing out uh, the huge population increases in municipalities in uh, Lebanon and also Jordan. 
but that uh, a response that targets the individual refugee with assistance doesn't take into account the things that we know that city authorities need to do on a daily basis, like keep the street lights on, clean the streets, and provide other basic services. Humanitarians don't tend to think about that, but I'm afraid there's also a territorialism here, and it's sometimes quite difficult for the development actors to get a space at the table to talk about what's going on in a displacement context. So yes, of course, we need to talk to development donors, but often they're in the same building um, and they need to talk to each other. Um, so um, on the um, Mediterranean integration, the Centre of Mediterranean integration, um, I'm, I'm sort of uh, aware of some of your work and I think that yes, as we um, progress, I think there will be some really interesting um, uh, learning coming out of our work for you and are happy to stay in touch. And then finally, um, to Joanne on how we're working with the Global Compact on Refugees and Migration and the 2030 Agenda. We very intentionally talked, use the term self-reliance in our project so that we have a hook to, because it is one of the pillars of the Global Compact for Refugees. We wanted to make sure that what we were saying sounded relevant to the people who talk about these issues. And also our idea there is also to, to sort of round out this definition of self-reliance. As I um, said, it's, it's a matter of concern when um, I don't know if I did say this, I've, I've been giving so many presentations, maybe, but it's a matter of concern when there's an assumption that if somebody is not is in an urban area, they're a refugee, and they're not receiving assistance, therefore they must be self-reliant. I think that's an extremely dangerous assumption to make. And so we want to understand more broadly what it means to be self-reliant um, by looking not just at livelihoods, but looking at issues of dignity and well-being as well, and how to live like an adequate life. So that is very much our intention to hook into those debates on the Global Compact on Refugees. The 2030 Agenda is a little bit more difficult. Um, it has, it, I'm afraid it pays very little attention to displaced populations and humanitarian issues. Despite the best efforts of myself with um, fantastic colleagues from UN Habitat, we spent many years trying to influence the text in all sorts of different ways to try and make sure that the that agenda did um, take, uh, and also the, the new urban agenda, sorry, and the 2030 agenda did take adequate, uh, paid adequate attention to migration and refugee issues, and, and it's scant. I'm afraid. So those perhaps those frameworks don't give us as much to go on as we would hope. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yes, we are sort of hooked into those as, as much as we can be into those international um, policy agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. Um, I think, Nodoka, may I ask uh, questions uh, from our side before I know you have to leave? But uh, I think we are wondering how has the refugee settlement model and urban planning impacted refugee response in those areas? Is... Nodoka? Thank you for the question. I think, um, Yuka, you've been to the camp and you know how we <laughs> operate. And um, Cox's Bazaar is a place where the, the huge crisis, the influx happened three years ago, but it is a place with continuous mini emergency, so to say. Um, it could be natural disaster, it could be other stuff. But um, I would say the, the concept or the idea um, that some of some part of our operation is working on working towards um, development and planning um, is still I think slowly it's been understood by different stakeholders and by the management. But I would say with COVID again, um, we couldn't we had very very minimized. Um, footprints in the camp. So it's moving very slowly. Um, one positive thing that you would probably be happy about is that now we we got an approval from the government on the two story um, constructions. So that will provide a huge space, create new space in the camp that was not um, available in the past. So with that in mind, and I'm sure some parts of the government, even if they cannot say that in officially, um, realizes how serious this issue is. And I think um, your effort and your team's effort in um, doing groundwork to, to have that planning um, document in place will be um, instrumental in, in having that initial dialogue with the government. Back to you. 
Thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm, I know it's how it's very difficult. I only know the partial of it, but thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. I know you have to go for the um, other meetings at this moment. But uh, may I uh, give it to Bridget now, um, Dr. Bridget, for the second uh, part of the session? Sure, Yuka. Thank you very much. So we will have a change of moderation. Um, I leave uh, Yuka now and present this role. But before introducing her, um, I wanted to have a small reaction also to the presentation on, on Bangladesh. Um, I can share that at that time in 2017, I have been working in Myanmar, so I was on the other side of the border. And listening to the presentation of uh, Nadoko, you can just hear what immense uh, influx it represented for Bangladesh to receive um, 700, 800,000 people within a period of a couple of weeks. And I think we have to give a lot of credit to Bangladesh, to the local and national government, to receive all those people in such a short period of time and to provide them the opportunity to stay because there's just no room for them at the moment and likely in the future to go back in what we say is a voluntary and safe return. So I think this needs to be credited because we speak a lot about the role of international actors in refugee context, but we also speak about refugee context in developing countries and what the developing countries themselves contribute is immense. And I think this needs to be credited. So now we move over to the second half of our session. And I have the pleasure to have uh, three panelists. And uh, the first one you already know very well, um, Ms. Uh, Yuka Gerada. Uh, Yuka is a human settlement officer at UN Habitat headquarters. And she leads the humanitarian and development practice team under planning, finance, and economic section. She has been managing multiple projects with a special focus on humanitarian programs, promoting sustainable approaches to human settlement and infrastructure development in both crisis and post-crisis contexts. She also has been coordinating the Kakuma Kalobei project, um, for which we collaborate, the Cities Alliance and UN Habitat collaborate. And from where I know Yuka myself, it has been a pleasure to work with you over the past two years, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Over to you, Yuka. Thank you so much. So I will um, basically present on the actual ongoing project, um, which is actually financed by, um, and then in collaboration with the Alliance and uh, financed uh, by the Swiss Development Corporations. Um, so next slide. So it just uh, before we begin uh, for, I think for the many other people did, um, Habitat is really um, looking into sustainable urbanization. So we really try to engage in any project which is achieved, uh, can achieve sustainable urbanizations. Um, yes, next slide. Just to give you some of the background information of the locations, um, I think uh, Governor <laughs> Nanok is after me, so <laughs> I don't want to say so much, but uh, just to give the bigger context uh, before it's going to give it to Governor, uh, is the basically we do have a, a kind of number of refugees from Somalia, Ethiopia, and South Sudan uh, and Uganda uh, and all, all all the surroundings and then uh, in Toka next night and then the Tokana is uh, is the northern part of Kenya as you can see I think it's very key to note that uh, there is actually ongoing upset corridor which is the um, highway which is coming through Lamu to uh, connecting to uh, Kakuma and Kalobeye, where we are, we are kind of our focused, um, and then also connectivities. And next slide. But uh, I think what you can see, can you go back to one more uh, one slide again? Yes. So there is a um, actually existing uh, um, corridor. It's in the, I think more towards the Tanzania. You can see the green green line. And then next slide. 
and you could see this is the population of of the kenya so you can see how population are coming along this corridor and then uh if you can uh actually in 2016 urbanization review by world bank about 85 percent of urban dwellers in kenya lives in 35 kilometers of a, um, this corridor while 75 percent of uh, total urban population lives in within 15 kilometers of the corridor. So you can see with upcoming this Namu to the connecting to the um, Kakuma Karobe, it can be a game changer for the near future. Next slide. And uh, we think that um, uh, it can really benefit of of the area with the corridor development uh, in the thinking in that way, in a sense that there is like a transportation. Uh, it can reduce the tra uh, travel time and cost, and then also improvement of logistics, and then also by adding that, it can also value added to the project, and we can also think it can have the new industry. It may come up. Next slide. So then what we are talking about is really this um, now, uh, I think the governor Nanok will go into detail with the more of what's going on in the Kakuma Kalabe as well. But this kind of uh, humanitarian investment and then all the other investment which is happening can be the catalyst to um, you know create the local economic development towards the Tokana county as it is. So how can we do that or how do we do that is the one. And then also uh, uh, trying to see through the research as well. Next. Uh, I think it's very important to look into it because not only just only for the kind of the parts of the uh, refugee uh, humanitarian context because uh, of the context of a Tokana county it is, it's very nice that they have been welcoming refugees itself, but their G, uh, 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 county uh, uh, gross uh, county product, which is GCP, is uh, the average gross is not, it's not even at the level of, uh, in terms of in Kenya, it's not at the level of, of the average for the whole national Kenya. So then it really needs to see how can we uh, leverage um, any opportunities so that everybody can be really in the uh, kind of a win-win situations on this, um, any events that is happening. Uh, and then you can see from these pictures on the on the left side, this is Tokana, um, especially around the corridor. But you can see this is a very semi arid uh, area and as well as uh, many of the people are in a pastoralist uh, lifestyle. Next slide. But uh, you can see, but it's a Tokana County as it is. It's uh, it's really growing uh, with the populations, and then. But I think I can. Uh, uh, we will mention it uh, also. But then, uh, Tokana do have a Kakuma uh, refugee camp, and then uh, and then once uh, since 1992. And then since that, uh, near you can see on the right side that um, this is the graph by World Bank uh, showing that um, as closer it gets with uh, with the Kakuma refugee camp, the less the life with uh, less pastoralist life that they have. So their life has been changing because of this refugee camp and then also humanitarian actions. But we are thinking that how can we can be uh, make it opportunities um, and then make it more action together. Next slide. And um, this is how it was in Kakuma and then how it's kind of Kakuma town itself is also growing. So then its influence of it is quite um, quite huge in a sense. So then, but we can really integrate into this um, kind of economic growth as it is. So that's how we are kind of trying to look into the, um, the research. Next slide. And if we see into the economy of, of the Tokana County, uh, it's really highly depend on the primary industry, on the pasteurism and the agriculture. 
and next slide. But this means it can really um, influence by climate change, and then also um, it will not uh, grow with uh, um, each individual uh, growth uh, growth capital uh, growth county product. So in order to kind of grow of the each uh, individual of the uh, GCP, it's very important to industrial to diversify and then also have kind of a job creation and delivery food improvement. Next slide. So uh, this is what we are doing now with a kind of uh, try to look into capture some of the opportunities as well. Um, you can see on the right corner with the plan of a color bay. This is the um, actually the color bay integrated uh, uh, plan, which uh, we are actually implementing together with Sokano County government as well as UNSCR um, to really create the space for the future for both hosts um, and refugees and, and try to see the future uh, prospect. And then uh, right near that, which is the this uh, line, is a uh, is the highway that I show in the beginning, and so this line this line is the the it will become to the highway which also connect down to Ramu, so then it can capture some of the investment opportunities. So we are trying to see if we can kind of create some of the um, it's still a kind of uh, um, I can suggest on stage. But uh, we were trying to see how can we create some kind of a special zone for economic special zone for maybe for both refugee and host community to have, or and then also um, inviting private sector investment opportunities. How can we do that? So this is a really up, uh, ongoing and working together with uh, county government as well as various stakeholders, including. Um, local communities to really start developing and then right now it's a uh, kind of of the concept uh, plan has been also developed and then it's really um, working together in a participatory manner as well. Next slide. But not only in that corner of, of a Kakuma Kalobe area, because that is just a one part, because Sokana County is really, really big. And then, the, and how does it really influence, um, you know, uh, with the corridor? And that's what we are also looking into. And so we did uh, actually the economic uh, survey and with uh, um, several small towns, uh, and then as well as more special focus to Kakuma Kalobeye area. Next slide. So we did kind of a quantitative uh, data corrections to really ask around. Of course, uh, it's right now is a little bit a sensitive time. So we did uh, quite a huge measure of kind of uh, um, uh, a little bit of protections. But uh, we have managed to actually um, survey and uh, collect uh, some data through several towns. Uh, next slide. And also with the participatory manner. Uh, next slide. And then we also have done uh, several focus group discussion to ensure the um, local residents, refugees, and host communities, business operators, and local leaders to be really engaged into this um, this process. Next slide. So some of the uh, points that we have so far, uh, we do have more, 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 points, but it just for this sessions, um, it's we really see the local industry with the potential for upscaling. So we are hoping that it's coming up, but we also see the infrastructure challenges remain as a major factor hindering social, economic, and local economic development in Tokyo West. But Napsec corridor, as I as I show in the uh, in the slides, this uh, uh, the highway is it can really improve the accessibility, the region possi uh, possibility to of the cross border trains, and. Of course, the border area have a potential for cross-border trace, and 
but insecurity and flooding is a very a threat to a sustainable urban settlement and a real development in Tokyo and the West. So I think we really have to consider of the climate change and all these things, um, how to manage over to create a resilience. And the humanitarian activities plays a critical um, in the economy of Tokyo West and Kakuma, how as far as we see. Um, and uh, epicenter for urban development in Tokyo West. Um, that's how we see so far, but we do have more things to come up. Next slide. This, so this is the final slide on our side. And it just, we really see as a UN habitat that the technical expertise on the urban planning and implementations and normative documentations and capacity building programs, especially for various stakeholders, not only government, but also communities um, to improve life of refugees and um, a further crisis and prepare local host communities for future is very important. And we really want to really see how can we make this win-win situations. So it's not only focus on one part, but how can we see more holistically as a regions and a holistically as and then how can we um, encourage people to kind of grow together and uh, develop together? So this is really the challenges that we are kind of looking at. And then of course, there's no answer yet, probably. But I think we are working together with Sokana County government and especially Governor <laughs> Nanok to really achieve these things. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yukat, for, for giving us an insight in this area of Kenya and the work that your inhabitant um, has been doing there in the past. I'd like to highlight in this project also that, and you will hear much more now from the governor of, of Turkana, that this is a project that really builds on a refugee situation and aims to, um, to leverage for a local economic uh, development strategy. Um, when I was in this region and in Kakuma, I heard many people referring to a, a border town in Turkana County 30 years ago, which was at that time the hub for the humanitarian intervention. And it was a very vibrant town, you know, with all the humanitarian input that came in. And suddenly this tension shifted down to Kakuma, another small town. What happened to the border town is that it imploded. Um, there was no more activity going on. And I think when we spoke to stakeholders in Kakuma, even if it was 30 years ago, it was very present in their mind. And they were telling us, we don't want that this happens in Kakuma as well. We want to use the presence of now so many refugees, which are three, four, five times the amount of the local people, and all the humanitarian aid that is coming in, the development aid that is coming in, to really build a sustainable model. And this is where we came in with this project and uh, one of the work with this alliance is to build systems of secondary cities. I mentioned that in my presentation, we focus on secondary cities, which in most cases are too small, have too little infrastructure or business investment to be competitive by themselves, but they can be competitive or they can work towards a sustainable economic strategy if they work together. And this uh, project where we are working with UN Habitat aims for it. It aims to leverage on the presence that is there, the investment by the humanitarian and international community, but by also building a system of secondary cities along this corridor to then become sustainable if the humanitarians and if the refugees at one point will not be there. So I stop here because we have, of course, the governor of Tukana here who can uh, speak much better about it. Um, I'm very happy um, to introduce Excellency, Honorable Josat Nanok, Governor of Tokana County in Kenya. The Governor is internationally renowned. Many of you know him um, for his leadership, really transformed the refugee situation in his county into an opportunity um, for social and economic progress. The Governor is the first Governor to be re-elected for a second term. I think that speaks for him and for his section a lot. And his leadership on the integration of refugees has made Jakarta County a role model across the region. Dear Governor, the floor is yours.
Governor, if you can you, yes. Can you hear me now? Can we you can hear, hear you. Me? We can hear you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget, uh, for being invited to this discussion at Magdinka's campus to just make a brief remark on um, on uh, using integrated planning to foster inclusive communities, the work that we are doing uh, in Turkana County, Kenya. Uh, whoever is moving the slides can move to the next slide. And indeed, uh, I have been listening to the presentations done by Dr. Lucy Hill and Nondoka Hasengawa, particularly on the Bangladeshi experience. But looking at uh, what we have in Turkana, it's basically a protracted refugee situation. Majority of the refugees have been there for quite some time. Uh, we experience these challenges uh, that Bangladesh is experiencing now, uh, much earlier. But now we are focusing on moving forward um, uh, uh, jointly with various partners. Just briefly, Turkana is um, the second largest county uh, in Kenya, uh, with uh, representing 13.5% of the landmass. And with a population of about 1.3 million, including 196,000 refugees. I'll move to the next slide. Uh, in terms of urbanization, uh, we've not been left very much left behind. Uh, as you can see from uh, the projected statistics of census, uh, we moved from uh, 164,000 project. Uh, population living in urban areas to now the new projection for this year, which is almost close to 250,000. So I, th I think this is a very major increase. I think it's an increase of almost 60%. And uh, we're going to be witnessing this as we move forward. Basically, the bigger push for this is um, the influx of refugees and settlements in Turkana West. Uh, uh, rural urban migration, uh, mainly influenced by climate change, of course, uh, we have now a huge uh, youthful population that has gone to school, uh, increasing uh, uh, opportunities uh, and increasing opportunities in the refugee camps. And within the county has led to uh, labor migration from uh, both the rural areas of Turkana, but also from outside Turkana. And of course, devolution has played a very key, uh, uh, key role. In, in providing much more opportunities and resources that are spent within the county. Uh, and of course, much of it within providing service delivery within the urban areas. Move on. Uh, when we began discussing with UNHCR and the other partners about what do we do with the protracted refugee situation and what do we do with the host community that has been facing uh, challenges, uh, basic service challenges similar to what refugees were facing, we sat down and came up with an idea in 2014 of having an integrated program that will be beneficial for both refugees and host communities. So we came up with a Kalobeye Integrated Social Economic Development Program, uh, a program uh, mooted for 15 years that is basically made in line with the Global Compact of Refugees, but also integrating uh, government development uh, frameworks, uh, the county integrated development plan in, at the local level, but also development programs at the national level. Um, we launched KISDEP uh, sometimes in 2019, and, and, and the various partners are playing a very big role. I think critical about this is the government goodwill, uh, both the national government and the county governments, uh, plus a whole sort of uh, development actors have conjoined to ensure that uh, this program is implemented. Uh, we, there's a budget of $500 million uh, uh, for this 15-year program. And, and uh, the aim is basically to build sust uh, sustainable services and economic opportunities for both the two communities, the refugees and host communities. Move on. Uh, as Yuka has just mentioned earlier, I think uh, the entire urban uh, planning is going to revolve around uh, uh, three communities as indicated in the map. But what we are going to be consolidating in a legislation that is awaiting approval of our local uh, legislative 
of uh, Kalobeye, uh, Kakuma Kalobeye municipality, which is going to be much larger than the three communities, but also encompassing a pastoralist community living around uh, those four, uh, those, those Kakuma and Kalobeye urban settlements. Um, this is going to be a major economic hub um, that is going to benefit host and refugees. And uh, we anticipate that there are going to be a lot of linkages in this new municipality that I believe will be in place uh, early next year uh, as, as a core area for potential growth, given the, the lapse at linkages, the road towards South Sudan, and the road to Lodua and Nairobi and Mombasa, uh, but also potentially road uh, linking to the new Lamu port. We believe that um, uh, uh, better planning of the municipality uh, is going to be very critical in ensuring that uh, value is accrued by both refugees and host. And, 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 and this planning, it's, it's at the very formative stages. Uh, because uh, 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 the issues of providing basic services uh, to make sure that uh, the municipality works and functions. We also hope that we it is going to be a very inclusive municipality. Uh, we will have a municipality board. We hope that refugees are also going to be represented on it. Uh, and a host of many other things that are going to be going to be planning alongside the uh, UN Habitat and, and all the other partners involved in uh, planning this municipality. Uh, along with other seven that uh, whose special planning has been done and awaiting the rollout of uh, of the development plan. Uh, move on. Yeah, I don't want to emphasize much. I think Yuka has already talked about the corridor plan. Uh, that is about it. Uh, there are many areas that are outside uh, the core uh, Kalobeye settlement, which we are going to be planning jointly. Uh, to make sure that uh, 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 this grow has important hubs and, and investments can be secured. Uh, there is a ready-made market within within uh, the, 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 the not only Kalobeye but the entire municipality and the rest of Turkana. Move on. I don't want to repeat about the importance of infrastructure, but I think uh, this is critical. There are also linkages of that lapsed corridor with Ethiopia and Uganda, uh, which would be very, very critical in the growth of uh, the urban area centers, particularly uh, Kakuma and Kalobeye municipality. Move on. Uh, as was explained by Yuka Machalia, I think we are looking at uh, potentially huge market uh, that has been assessed two years ago of 5.6 million U uh, US dollars. Uh, and of course, almost close to 410, 510,000 uh, population uh, that includes refugees and host communities. And uh, so, so, so this is going to be a critical area of development. Uh, and it has also been enhanced. In fact, two weeks ago, I launched uh, the fastest uh, speed internet of 140 core at uh, Nadapal uh, border point. And so that stretch between Nadapal and Eldoret is going to be served with the, the highest speed internet in the country. So I think these are opportunities that are going to be benefiting uh, users of, um, of, of internet services in Kal Kakuma and Kalobeye municipality, but also creating opportunity for uh, ICT companies to be able to invest in this particular area. Move on. So I, I think that is it. And uh, I'm also glad to have had uh, the, the research feedback. I think uh, it is critical. Uh, those research findings are shared in details. We will hope that uh, we will be uh, learning lessons from this as we continue to improve our better designing and planning of Kakuma, but also uh, appreciate uh, the good work UN Habitat is doing with us uh, jointly with the other UN partners and all the other development partners. And I hope that uh, uh, that mutual relationship will continue for for the benefit of, uh, of the refugees and host uh, communities. We do hope eventually at the end of this that 
be uh, cohesion. Stronger cohesion is going to be created. I think it's already happening right now. Uh, but building uh, communities, building communities that can be able to, uh, once they return back home, be able to utilize the skills they have learned uh, uh, to create uh, cities and urban settlements uh, back in the areas. And knowing that majority of these refugees are from South Sudan, I think what they learn from Kakuma Kalubaye will be much will be much more beneficial for them when they return back home and be those in the forefront of of of, of urbanizing and improving uh, uh, the uh, urban settlements. I thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you for sharing this vision and leadership with us. Um, later in the Q and A, I would highly appreciate also to hear your recommendation to other countries in the Horn of Africa on what they can learn, what is the takeaway message from the experiences you made in Jakarta. We were very pleased to have uh, members of your administration last year in Bern, Switzerland, and they shared their perspective already with guests from Uganda, Ethiopia. And this year we will also have Geneva Navoy with us in, in two weeks to discuss on urban planning, but for the Q&A session, it will be very interesting to hear what would you recommend to your fellow um, leaders in the Horn of Africa to take away from the experience you make. Um, I'd like to hand out, I think somebody has its microphone on. Um, Governor Nanook, if you could mute your microphone. Yes, I can hear you. If you could please mute your microphone. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, because we had an echo in the room. So I would like to introduce now our last speaker. It's my pleasure um, to introduce uh, Mr. John Makoa. He's the country representative of AFSI in Uganda. AFSI has a very large representation in Uganda and uh, an experience that goes back decades. We are very pleased to have this member of the Cities Alliance also our implementing partner for project in Arua in Uganda. This was the city which you have seen in the video at the beginning of, of our event. And uh, John will speak more about the challenge and the opportunities um, that are now on the table in terms of giving more visibility to the numbers of refugees that are actually settled in, in Arua city. Um, John, I hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Um, I think a lot of my work was done, especially in the video. There was a lot of background information that would be very important for us to keep, to keep at the back of our mind as I make my uh, presentation. Um, we are partnering with the city of Aroa and also the government in general mainly because of the need to enumerate refugees in, the, in, the, in Arua city. Arua city is one of the secondary cities in Uganda, but it particularly lies in an area that has a large number of refugees. I will come to that a bit later. So the project we are carrying out is a two-year project. Uh, next slide. We are carrying out a, pro a two year project that is strengthening the mechanism for receiving, managing, and integrating uh, involuntary migrants within Arua, Arua City. As you can see, the, uh, the main goal of this project is tr to strengthen the structure and institutional mechanism for reception, management, and integration of involuntary migrants in the, in the city. And uh, we are doing this work thanks for the support that is coming from the Swiss Agency for Development through the Cities Alliance. We received a, quite a good collaboration and support from Cities Alliance. But uh, ABSI as an organization has a long history in collaboration with Cities Alliance. I'll mention that also uh, a bit later. So the objective of this uh, project is to support research, documentation, collaborative learning and knowledge on the management of reception, integration, and the management of uh, uh, involuntary migrants. But on the other hand, also we have an objective to strengthen the institutional
John, you unmuted yourself. You muted yourself. Sorry. Okay, back there. Sorry, sorry about that, Bridget. Uh, I was just saying that the second aspect of this is to strengthen the institutional and structural capacity of Arua City Council and stakeholders uh, to effectively manage reception integration of the, the refugees. And the other is to modern and adapt sustainable livelihoods approaches for host communities and the migrants to leverage on the existing opportunities within this city. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, on this slide, I'll first give you a preamble. I think much of the preamble was in the, in the video that we saw, but I just want to tell you that Uganda, we have a population of about 40 million. We are, we are hosting more than 1.4 million refugees. And the area we're talking about in the West Nile region hosts close to 700,000 uh, refugees. And um, Uganda fortunately has a very pragmatic approach to refugee management. And the, the Refugee Act in 2006 uh, enables the refugees to, to live, to work, even to start small businesses. And uh, the, much of this also has been captured within the Uganda country refugee response plan to try and see how this, the integration of these things can happen. So Uganda is moving away from just care and maintenance to inclusion and the self-reliance. But at the same time, uh, while we have this conducive refugee policy, uh, we also have, uh, we also understand that only Kampala was known to be the only urban center where refugees would be officially recognized. So for us, it was a big breakthrough to have this collaboration with the government to do a census in Arua, their acceptance was an indication of the fact that they recognize this need and their collaboration has been very instrumental in us carrying out this work. Arua, like many secondary cities, experiences the highest sense of uh, urban migration and these lead to a number of uh, issues that I mentioned here, congestion, cultural clashes, uh, rise in crime, increase in urban poverty, uh, and uh, I think the lady that was in the video mentioned it all. She said, we share the little with them, meaning that the resources are limited, and yet they have to share those resources with the refugees that come into the city. Next slide. What do we expect in, in this project? Well, our expectation is that the, or the results of what we are going to carry out will give us an informed policy planning and resource allocation on the reception management integration of migrants through accurate data and documentation. We also expect that the strengthened, uh, we shall have a strengthened institutional and structural capacity that uh, for Arua City Council and stakeholders to effectively manage the refugees that are coming into the, to the city. And we shall also have an improved socioeconomic status of extremely poor and vulnerable uh, migrants. But already was, we have also had some dividends towards this, in the sense that during the, the budget conference, the annual budget conference for the Arua city, uh, the councils came up saying they want to include their planning, they want to include the already the figures and the, all the expectations that we get out of our study within their planning, within the city planning. So this is already a, a point that has already been that is striking at the heart of their needs. So we are happy to see that they, they are happy with the work that we are, we are going to do and we've done, and that they are able to take this work as their own and they're able to include it in their district uh, development plans. Why the need for this accurate data? The, the census will inform the policy and uh, it will be able to ensure that there is a, a appropriate resource allocation because they will know which people are there, where they are, what are their needs. This will be very important for us. But I, one of the things that was key to our collaboration was the fact that we used the government agency, uh, the Uganda Bureau of uh, Statistics, and uh, they are the ones that uh, supported us to do this census. This gives a lot of credibility to the census. It gives it acceptability, but it also enshrines it within 
uh, the, the government structures and, and needs so that it can be used appropriately. Uh, we also train the numerators for these census that uh, were to collect this data from more than 13,000 households in Arua, in, a, in the Arua city. And uh, we hope that this report will be due by the end of November. The photo you see there are some of our enumerators showing their, their tools and uh, when they had just started their work. Next, next slide. Uh, next, next slide. Move to the next slide. Yes, uh, this photo here shows us the, the director of uh, Uganda Bureau of Statistics who came to visit and also to do uh, monitoring just to ensure that uh, our data collectors were doing the right thing, they were provide, uh, collecting the right quality of data, uh, and that everything was running according to schedule. So the fact that the whole director of this department could be sent to come and join us, that showed us the importance of the of, of government in terms of uh, underpinning uh, the, the, the work that we were doing that will be able to support the planning for the future. Let's move to the next slide. Um, what, part of what we have done also is to carry out an organizational capacity assessment uh, for the Arua city. Uh, this capacity assessment is, is helping us to see what are, the, what are the profiled needs. For example, the use of data, proposal writing, child safeguarding, uh, conflict resolution, uh, developing policy briefs, analysis, budget and advocacy implementing economic programs, risk assessment, planning and management, refugee, migrant policies, strategic planning. These, these are the needs already which came out when we were uh, doing the, the organizational capacity assessment for the, for the Arua city. Next. Okay, I just want to conclude by saying that um, for us this, this uh, process, this project was, is first of all very important, is one of the, perhaps the first project that has been able to do a census for immigrants in the secondary city, because the only city that was recognized to host, host immigrants was uh, Kampala, the, the main city, Kampala. So that meant that the government had to bend backwards to allow us to do this because they realized the importance of the information that we are collecting and also recognizing the fact that this information might also be important for other secondary cities. And you heard also from the video that the Minister Isaac Mosumba from the Minister of Honorable Isaac Mosumba, Minister of Urban Development, was mentioning the importance of that uh, census. And uh, we had a lot of collaboration also with other actors within this work. We had a collaboration from UNHCR, uh, office of the Prime Minister, these two have the mandate, the, the biggest mandate within the, the camps and also for refugees and therefore their collaboration with us was uh, very, very vital. And I will conclude by just thanking um, Cities Alliance for, first of all, initiating this because for us in Uganda, given the number of refugees that we have, uh, we have a very good policy, national policy. But at the same time, sometimes these policies have cracks that need to be filled. And some of those cracks is the fact that we have urban refugees that are assumed to be in the camps, and yet they seek for their livelihoods within the secondary cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for this presentation. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, I'd like to, go the, the, like to have the audience to take away messages also from, from this presentation. The first one is, you have heard John speak about Kampala having had the means to enumerate refugees. Kampala, the primary capital city of Uganda, where secondary cities, and we have, I think, seven, eight, nine secondary city in the border areas, who claim by their own accounts to have 25, 
of their residents being refugees, but it's not formally recognized. So you, the takeaway message is here, you have a power disparity even within the country and within the systems of cities on how a city can actually um, advocate, lobby for more support for refugees residing in their places. I think the second takeaway message I'd like for the audience is, um, like John presented it, is, it was quite a straightforward process. It isn't, and it wasn't. Um, for the secondary cities in Uganda to get this recognition, formal recognition of so many refugees seeking, seeking a home in their city is a big step, it's a big step forward. And I believe we as international development actor need to make this a safe step forward. Um, minister, um, the Minister of Lands is the board member to the Cities Alliance. And of course, there's a concern that the more open cities become, the more support can be given in cities. There's a concern that there will even be a stronger influx from the settlement areas and that the city, cities then cannot cope with it. So while we as international community lobby for out of the camp policies, we also need to see that there's sufficient support given to cities so that they can manage the reception and then the integration of the refugees as well. Otherwise, there are a lot of fears and concerns on all sides. And I think our role is to prepare the mechanisms that these fears can be can be addressed. Not perfectly, but step by step. And we grow with the experience. So now my role is to just feed back the questions from the chat to the panelists. And I have three questions that I can see. Um, Yuka, I'd like to start with the question from Severine from uh, the Swiss Development Agency in Nairobi, and she refers to the support to the IFC. Um, Yuka, if you just can explain briefly the, the engagement you had with IFC also during the, the webinar earlier this year, just to provide an update how you cooperate. Sure, thank you, Bridget. Um, so we are pretty much uh, very much aware, and that's uh, we have been collaborating uh, actually quite from the beginning. And then so we also have a collaborative uh, workshop uh, together with them to ensure that uh, they have been engaged also on our side. And also we see uh, IOC programs as a great, great opportunities and a chance to accelerate and scale up. So um, we will be um, Quite, we are actually also as a uh, agency. We are quite excited, and uh, we are hoping to work, especially together with uh, Tokana County government, to ensure things will be happening on the ground as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now, Governor Nanook, as promised, Rebecca and Mr. Abdul Kadir Hussein from Somali, they had similar questions that I also had. What can other cities, other countries in the Horn of Africa learn from your experience? And I think Abdul Kariya really hits the, hits the point here, is asking how did you manage to, to mediate the interests of the refugees and the host communities? Because there are a lot of free assumptions and concerns. How did you manage to mediate it? Okay, thank you, Bridget. Uh, yes, I, I noted the two questions, um, plus also the what you had mentioned just before, just immediately after I done up my presentation. Uh, for Rebecca Roberts, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we are developing an existing framework, and I think the main one is uh, working in collaboration within KISDIP, uh, which is uh, uh, a very critical framework that uh, many partners and many other regions within Africa can be able to look into and copy. Uh, we have also begun discussions just before uh, COVID came in uh, of a partnership with uh, Bolange, Bolange municipality in Sweden. Uh, Bolange municipality uh, has a population of about 100,000, 150,000, and they host uh, uh, refugees who've been integrated as citizens and as as uh, residents of the municipality. So, so that is still a partnership we are developing. Um, uh, we hope that uh, we can be able to fast track it uh, uh, once uh, COVID issues are no longer a problem for traveling and engagement. 
um, but we are willing, ready and willing to share the experiences with uh, many other areas that uh, that will want to go the direction that we have taken. Uh, to Abdul Gadir Bashir, yeah, yes, indeed, um, uh, uh, our engagement and the program of KISDEP has basically broken the walls of distrust. Uh, at the very initial beginning, there were major concerns because um, uh, a lot of uh, development uh, funding before was directly going to refugees alone um, and very literal uh, to the uh, outside community. Government interventions were also limited. So you will uh, notice that there were more needs among the host communities than the refugees themselves. And that became a cause of conflict, particularly where sharing where water resources were concerned and, and, and many other issues. Um, so when we came in, and I think an opportunity came in with uh, the overpopulation of, uh, of, uh, of Kakuma refugee camp and UNHCR wanted additional uh, land to, to depopulate the refugee camp. And so that opportunity was the opportunity we utilized to bring about an idea of a settlement in Kalubiye. Uh, uh, it took uh, some months of discussions back and forth. We eventually had consensus between uh, uh, not only government, but uh, development partners, but also the refugees themselves through their leadership and the host communities, that we will need to see a new settlement where hosts and, and refugees will be equitably uh, supported both uh, in the short term and long term, and 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 that basically eased the conflicts that were there before, and 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 there is much more social cohesion, and uh, we have been emphasizing that much more on uh, on joint meetings of local leaders, uh, uh, political leaders, uh, being highlighted on issues that are going on. We have already we are already planning a similar meeting of stakeholders next week so that uh, we can be able to get a head start heads up on where we are uh, so far with the program. And, and then eventually to what Bridget had asked much earlier, what, what are the lessons? What are the lessons learned uh, from uh, implementing the KISDEP? And I think the most critical one, number one, is that uh, uh, the humanitarian and development nexus is possible to achieve. And I think we've made that possible uh, through KISDEP. Uh, where a small percentage, I think for about 40 percent percentage uh, funding is, is going towards uh, humanitarian uh, uh, priorities, while the other one is a much looking at a much more longer term. And, and, and this is now being supported by the initiatives which uh, IFC has brought in with uh, uh, huge support to the private sector. And I know that uh, the two communities are going to be the biggest beneficiaries. Uh, but also the issue of integrated planning, bringing in integrated planning and integrating it with the regional, national, and local development uh, uh, planning documents that I think has been one of the critical lessons learned. Uh, the other one is also the legislative support which the county government has provided towards uh, uh, making sure there is harmony and, and the two communities are living together through the special planning we've talked about. Uh, Public Participation Act uh, that has enabled us to be able to bring public participation to the refugees also, including uh, informing the county budget uh, and all the other planning tools and uh, legislation that we are creating. Uh, but also, uh, I think also more critical is the joint collaboration between the development partners, the government, uh, and leaders and local communities. I think those four are more key lessons learned that can be replicated and learned by uh, programs uh, elsewhere. So I thank you. Thank you, Governor. I may add one element, and that is strong, strong political leadership um, by you to recognize that there are opportunities to bridge the humanitarian development and also to recognize how you can contribute to both host communities and refugees. But I think this is something we can share to other other regions as well by, by your leading. I thank, you the, yeah. Th thank you for mentioning. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I normally don't like self praise. I think it's important when others say it. You're most welcome. It's just true. 
I move to the last question, which we have for John, and it comes again from uh, from Abdul Kadir. Abdul Kadir, I just want to mention you seem very interested. You have very concrete needs which you want to to have addressed. Please also feel reach, feel free to reach out to UN Habitat. They are implementing large programs in Somalia with the support also from Switzerland. They have a lot of experience on the ground. And please also feel free to reach out to the Cities Alliance so that we can link you up with, with other discussions. So we shouldn't end here for today. Um, please reach out. Now the question for John, I think you have picked it up. Special case for Arua, but I leave it to John to ask. Over to you, John. Of course, uh, the context of migrants, the urban areas sometimes, even in the camps, sometimes comes with the conflict. And uh, at, the, at the insert of this uh, project, we already had this in mind. But you have to also to understand that it's, it's a little bit, um, how can I say, um, this, uh, I have been amazed by how open the the host community has been in these areas you had the lady there talking about we share the little we have and they have a history of um, having been refugees themselves across on the other side so they always keep in mind that they can also be in refugees elsewhere and therefore they have an openness that is quite amazing but nonetheless i think one of the things we did is to ensure that what we were doing was transparent one is that we had to have discussions with the United uh, UNHCR and at the same time with the office of the Prime Minister to, uh, to let them know what we are going to do, how we are going to do it, why we are going to do it, to have their go ahead, their consent, their participation. And at the same time, we also signed a memorandum of understanding with the, with the Arua district. That means that we spell out what we are going to do, why we are going to do it, what are the expectations, because sometimes some of the things that bring uh, confusion uh, come from expectations. And, uh, and then, as I've seen, we've had a long history of uh, our approach to refugees. We always say we do, not, we, we do not have a dividing line between emergency and development, because uh, many of the refugees that come in that area, they come maybe for one day, they hope, maybe two months, they hope, and they end up remaining there for the rest of their lives. So when we are making our interventions, we always come from the perspective, uh, perspective that they will stay there long enough. And therefore, we give them solutions that are durable, solutions that are able to help them uh, in the long term. Uh, but one of the things that we ensured, because knowing very well that sometimes conflicts arise, maybe resource allocation, maybe expectation and so on, we involved the local communities. We involved the local communities in every step of what we did. We also involved them in, uh, uh, in the enumeration process. Therefore, they were well aware of what we are doing. They were also knew that what we are trying to do is to collect information that will help the whole community as a whole. And therefore, that always helps to, to soften the ground and also helps to ensure that they buy in and they, they understand that the work we are doing is for the good of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I, I also observed that Arua is a special case. These are these refugee situations where an ethnic community of the, of the same ethnic community seeks refuge across the border. Um, nevertheless, challenges remain. Um, we have seen this also today in Bangladesh. It's also the same ethnic community that was welcomed by Bangladesh, so it, it, it helps a lot. Um, but there are still the remaining challenges that, uh, that the local governments and regional governments need to address. Um, this brings us to an end to today's, uh, today's event. Um, I would like to inform everybody that this is a series of urban thinker campuses. Um, there are three. This is the second one which you attend. And you see in the chat that uh, Stephanie, our colleague from UN Habitat, already announced the third and last session, which will focus on cities and IDPs. Um, it will be held on December 10th, and we hope to see many of you there again. Um, speakers will come from West Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia. 
and we will communicate in, in due time the, the further details. From my end, um, I conclude here. I have a couple of take-home messages for myself. I definitely take back again the, the really old discussion of, of silos. Um, silos are not bad. There might be people focusing on urban areas, on humanitarian aspects, on development aspects. For me, this is a group where you seek expertise within your silos. We just don't have to forget to build the bridges across the silos. And I think we, we have to lead this in our daily work and, and by our own activities that we have in front of us. It will continue to stay and it's an individual approach of us to address it. Another takeaway is, for me, it's always a bit, uh, I think you say, the elephant in the room. We discussed much about cities and refugees today. And Lucy um, referred to it, saying that much of the research and much of, of the aid still focuses on settlements and camps, whereas most of the refugee are in cities by, by recent research. So there's a lot of work to do to encourage the perspective to how do you support the refugees, how do you support the cities to welcome the refugees um, in these situations and to have a stronger advocacy around this topic. Um, I want to thank my fellow panelists. I want to thank uh, Lucy, Nanok, the governor, John, Yuka for your participation today. Um, I'm looking forward to continue to work with you. And a special thanks also to all the supporters of this work today with Switzerland and with DFID. Lucy, I first have to learn the new name um, for making this all possible, that we can meet and research and implement on the ground and learn from each other. Thanks to all. It's all from my side and uh, I wish you a good day. Bye bye. Bye, Yuka. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, I was like trying to see. Thanks a lot for the support, Leon. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. See you. See you. Senator.